Interesting title for a book, if nothing else, but there's a lot more else. Weird Secrets Inside the Canyon. Laurel Canyon, Covert Ops, and the Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream, written by David McGowan, who was, uh, who was down there. This is it's quite a fascinating book. It's a look at uh, a little niche in Hollywood land, greater Hollywood land, that begat an awful lot of the icons and stars and celebrities and trendsetters of uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s. It, it really, I mean, think about this. Laurel Canyon in the 1960s and early 70s was a, a magical place where a dizzying array of musical artists congregated to create much of the music that provided the soundtrack to those very turbulent times. Members of bands like The Birds, The Doors, Buffalo Springfield, The Monkees, The Beach Boys, The Turtles, The Eagles, The Flying Burrito Brothers, Frank Zappa, and The Mothers of Invention, of course, Steppenwolf, CSN, Three Dog Night, and Love, along with Such singer-songwriters as Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, James Taylor, and Carole King lived together and jammed together in the bucolic community nestled in the Hollywood Hills. But there was a dark side to that scene as well, and that's captured in Dave McGowan's new book. Many didn't make it out of there alive. We never hear about those, of course. And many deaths remain shrouded in mystery to this very day. Far more integrated into the scene than most would like to admit was a guy by the name of Charles Manson, along with his murderous entourage. Also, floating about the periphery were various political operatives, up-and-coming politicians and intelligence personnel, the same sort of people who gave birth to many of the rock stars populating the canyon. And all the canyon's colorful characters, rock stars, hippies, murderers, and politicians, politicos to be more exact, happily coexisted alongside a covert military installation. That's quite a book description. Hello, Dave. Can you hear me all right? I can indeed. How are you doing? I'm all right. Were were you there? Were you in it? I was not in it. I was uh, unfortunately born a little too late. I was born in 1960, so uh, uh, my 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 teen years, my formative years, were in the uh, late 70s. So I was about a decade too late. To, what got uh, you? Uh, well, what got you interested in this? Where'd you hear about it? Um, you know, it just, it was kind of a fluke, really. But by the way, you did a you did a fantastic job on that. Are you available for uh, recording audio books? <laughs> I I would always uh, yeah I would like to do some audio books actually it'd be fun. Um, what got me? It, it it was really a fluke actually. Um, you know, uh, like well, about seven years ago, I was uh, I was going on vacation with my then wife, and uh, we were heading off to, I believe, to uh, Hawaii. As I explain it in the preface to the book, it, it, it began very innocently uh, when I was going on vacation, and my goal was really to kind of try to escape from, <laughs> from all of this, uh, the insanity that, you know, I normally spend my time researching and writing about. And my daughter had gotten me a book by Michael Walker called Laurel Canyon that, uh, you know, tells a very uh, mainstream version of the of the story and it just seemed like that would be sort of the perfect uh you know last speech uh you know turning off your mind kind of a, a book that i could just uh you know relive all this great music that had sort of provided the soundtrack to my youth and uh escape from from all the madness that i usually mm-hmm. spend my time delving into and instead <laughs> uh as i read through this book there was all these little little red flags that kept coming up, you know, and um, kind of ended up ruining my vacation, really, because uh, I, I just got so so absorbed in, in the story and all of the little, all of the little kind of throwaway details that uh, he just kind of tossed off to the side as, as you know, sort of uh, interesting, but, you know, uh, insignificant uh, little details. And uh, to me, 
me, you know, the more I read into it, the more I realized that there was a whole other story, um, you know, hidden hidden in those details. And so as soon as I got back from the vacation, I uh, I just dove headlong into the subject and, and just started getting every book and, and gathering every book and magazine article and web post and everything I could find, uh, you know, that had ever been written about that scene and uh, putting all the little all the little pieces together that didn't quite fit in with the peace, love, and understanding, you know, picture that we're supposed to have of the scene. And, um, right. you know, eventually realized that, that there was a whole nother, a whole nother side to that scene and a whole nother story that, that, uh, needed to be told. So, um, it just, it just grew out of that. Just a, a fluke, really. I mean, I, I grew up alongside of it, you know, um, I grew up in Torrance, like 20 miles south of the mouth of Laurel mm-hmm. Canyon. And, you know, throughout my adult life, I've driven through it hundreds of times, getting across the city and, you know, just used it as another thoroughfare through the city and, and never knew that it had any special significance at all. You know, I mean, that, that's one of the amazing things about it is, is that so few people even know the mainstream <coughs> story of, of Laurel Canyon, even, even native, uh, you know, Angelinos, people that grew up here. Are uh, are largely unaware that that this whole scene never even happened. So um, yeah, even even though I grew up alongside of it, uh, you know, I, I knew I really knew nothing about it until mm-hmm. like seven eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, have everything that I know, is, everything that went into the book, is, is all stuff that I've learned <clears throat> since then. So. Can you tell me which came first, the music and the hippies? and then the government, or the government, and then the music and the hippies? I believe it's the latter. I, you know, I mean, I, uh, you know, there's long been debate about the 60s counterculture and, and, you know, whether it was at some point, uh, you know, co-opted, so to speak, and misdirected by the government. But, uh you know, based on every all the research that I've done, it, I would conclude that it was that it was never legitimate. You know, from the start, that it was that it was uh, created. You know, as a uh, as a you know uh, psyop, so to speak, <laughs> from the beginning, and that everything that grew out of it was. You know, uh, the, the, I, I don't I don't think it was ever the organic you know grassroots. Uh, sort of thing that, that we're supposed to well, believe this, it is. This, of course, dovetails into uh, Tavistock and the concept of Tavistock had a lot to do with pop culture, pop music, uh, created it, manufactured it, disseminated it, and it took off uh, from there. Now, in the canyon, in Laurel Canyon, where was this military, I guess it was an obvious military facility of some kind, was it in the canyon or just nearby? No, it was actually right in the canyon. It was on um, uh, Wonderland Path Avenue, I think it was what oh, it was. A, it's a, it's pretty a, much right in the heart of the canyon. There's and, a psychedelic uh, name actually, for you. What's that? There's a psychedelic name for you, Wonderland <laughs> Path. Yeah. Yeah, well, Wonderland Avenue is one of the uh, one of the main, main uh, routes through there, and, of course, where the infamous Wonderland murders uh, occurred. And, um, but, uh, yeah, look at, look at my laboratory was, uh, right smack dab in the center of the canyon, actually. And it was, I think it was initially built, according to most reports, it was initially built as, as a covert, uh, air defense facility, like during well, like World a, War II. An, a- an old Ajax missile site or something? Something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like what they, like the fortifications they have up in San Francisco mm-hmm. and they were mm-hmm. uh, built in that same era. And uh, and then it morphed into a a uh, covert film studio where they processed uh, all the film stock from the atomic weapons test and uh, right there in Coldwater Canyon, Laurel Canyon. I, What's I that? Know. They processed the film right there in Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Oh, they had a lot of other facilities. I wonder why they. That's interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it was uh, it was actually said to be the world's only complete uh, self-contained film studio. 
I mean, they could do everything from soup to nuts, so to speak. They had film vaults, they had sound stages, they had special effects departments. Yeah. They had everything they needed to do a complete film uh, in-house from beginning to end. Uh, the only studio in the world that, uh, at the time that had that, uh, that capacity. And according to the various reports, a lot of the technology... Um, you know, that we see today uh, was first developed there. They had it before anyone else, like, you know, 3D technology and, and uh, hmm. I don't know, various other things. So you're talking about uh, early black ops stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, technically it was, uh, <laughs> it was primarily used for, um, you know, like I say, pro- they processed all of the atomic weapons uh, test footage there. Uh, in fact, some of it, you, there, there, there's actually film stock that uh, has their logo stamped on it. So, you know, Lookout Mountain Laboratory. <laughs> and um, But they also did propaganda film. And, and they employed uh, some of Hollywood's biggest biggest stars. Uh, you know, people like John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe and uh, big-name film directors like Howard Hawks and John Ford and... Uh, I don't know, various other people, big names, you know, like Jimmy Stewart, and, uh, who did, did work for the facility uh, on a class, you know, of a classified nature. And um, none, of them, none of them ever talked about it, you know, during their lifetime. So, you know, we don't really know what exactly it was that they did. But they, at times, you know, there, there, were, there were Hollywood luminaries who reported to duty there doing something. So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, facility, to say the least, and, and the fact that it just so happened to be lo- located literally right in the heart of where the whole 60s counterculture thing, you know, was kind of given birth, um, you know, right right around, literally right, on, right around this, uh, this facility. So, uh, yeah, very odd, to say the least. Question. Some of the people I named in the introduction... Do you think they may have been trained Intel assets with musical talent? Or were there, there had to be a genesis for all of this talent. And I'm wondering if it, if it was grassroots or if it was somehow computer projected to be cool. Uh, they knew where the masses could be taken. And they turned these people loose in this group and, and encouraged others to move there, whatever. They, they tend to mag magnetize each other and move in together, but where did the talent come from? Was it contrived or was it real? Uh, well, I think, some, I mean, some of these people definitely had talent. Uh, no, there's no know, question I mean, about that, right. But did they get... It's, it's let's undeniable. Say, I mean, you know, some of the, the, the songs, the music that was created then is, you know, uh, you can still turn on any number of classic rock stations on the radio today and, you know, hear these songs played as daily staples, you know, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. you know, these artists, uh, there was, you know, phenomenal music and there was definitely a, a considerable amount of talent there. <clears throat> but the question is, why were so many of them, was such a huge preponderance of them, uh, you know, from direct, come directly from military and military intelligence families, you know, it's just, uh, Far more so than could be accounted for by, you know, just coincidence or by uh, the fact that a lot of people have suggested that uh, that these people were, were rebelling against, you know, the, the values of, of their of their parents and whatnot. And, uh, and that may be true in some cases, but just the sheer number of them who can be traced directly to the military intelligence establishment would seem to suggest that there was something more at play than just talent, well, would they you know, would they necessarily know that they were being messed with, seeded, so to speak, to go in amongst this group? No, they wouldn't. I, I think a lot of them were probably groomed from you know, so to speak, from a pretty early age, you know, and um, and and some of these, some of them came from very very wealthy and, and powerful families that that went back that go back you know, 200 plus years in American history and, uh, you know, the families that have wielded vast amounts of, uh, you know, financial and political power, 